This is the avocado. I first encountered one sometime in the 1990s, in its guacamole form. I didn't actually know what an avocado looked like until some years later. I grew up in the state of Minnesota. And if you know anything about the climate of Minnesota, you can be certain there are no avocados growing anywhere near its 10,000 lakes. But in the 1990s, they started appearing, mostly in their guacamole form. But their presence in the produce section of my local grocery store was on the rise. Flash forward a couple decades, and avocados can be found pretty much everywhere. But it wasn't always like that. For a long time, avocados were an obscure product of Mexico and South America. In the United States, they were grown in small parts of California and Florida, but that's about it. So what happened that made this rather ugly fruit so popular? Well, the Super Bowl happened. But first, let's talk about prehistoric megafauna. The original customer base for the avocado wasn't millennials or even Mexican restaurants. It was an armadillo the size of a VW bug and a sloth as large as an African elephant. These giant prehistoric mammals, along with a variety of other megafauna, roamed South America during the Pleistocene hundreds of thousands of years ago. The avocado evolved in conjunction with these animals' eating habits. It's why they have such large seeds. These megafauna were capable of swallowing an avocado whole. The seed would then pass through the animal's massive digestive system intact and be deposited on the ground, encased in a packet of its own fertilizer. Suffice it to say, it was a great time to be an avocado. But about 10,000 years ago, all the megafauna went extinct. After that, no surviving species had a large enough gullet to eat the avocado's seeds whole. The plant is even toxic to a large number of present-day animals, but not humans. Evidence of avocado cultivation goes back thousands of years. The first known written account of an avocado was by a Spanish conquistador in the 16th century. But the avocado didn't make it across the U.S.-Mexico border until the mid-19th century. And it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century when some enterprising California farmers finally tried to capitalize on this weird-looking fruit. First of all, these avocado farmers had their work cut out for them. The avocado was not only weird-looking, but it had a pretty unappetizing name. Back then, it was called the alligator pear, probably because the skin of an avocado bears a superficial resemblance to the skin of a large carnivorous swamp-dwelling reptile. Not the most appealing imagery to have a potential customer base associate with your food product. These farmers might as well have been trying to sell alien eggs for consumption, as far as the public was concerned. So these California farmers banded together to give the avocado's image a facelift. First off, they needed to change its name. Alligator pear just wasn't going to cut it with the focus groups. So in 1915, they rebranded it as the avocado, which incidentally is derived from this word, which basically means testicle fruit. It's a different language, so nobody cared. But that didn't mean avocado sales suddenly took off. It was still a foreign fruit unfamiliar to most Americans. People didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't sweet. You couldn't really cook with it. It remained green even when it was ripe, and it could only be grown in certain areas of the country. So the avocado was relegated to a luxury item, something akin to lobster or caviar. It would stay that way for a long time, partly because that was how it was marketed. But the low-fat diet craze of the 1980s would sideline the avocado even further. Avocados are rich in monounsaturated fat. Today we call this kind of fat good fat. But in the 1980s, we didn't discriminate. All fat was bad. If you wanted to be skinny and beautiful and have a long flowing mullet and wear big shoulder pads, you didn't dare eat an avocado. Even doctors were discouraging their consumption. The avocado industry fought back. They formed their own nutritional task force to combat the anti-avocado movement, but it would take years of research and education to teach the general public the difference between good and bad fats. All the while, most of the American public still didn't really know what an avocado was, much less the health benefits of eating one. But at the close of the 1980s, the avocado would finally catch a break, thanks to the Super Bowl. Even though the Super Bowl had been around for over 20 years by this time, the Super Bowl party was a rather new addition to this hallowed American pastime. And no American get-together was complete without an ungodly amount of snacks. The avocado industry understood this implicitly. While they didn't think they were going to sneak whole avocados into America's living rooms, they did have one secret weapon, guacamole. Guacamole was already a pretty well-known dip at this point, a common sight at many a social gathering, not just Super Bowl parties. But the timing of the Super Bowl gave avocados a distinct advantage. Most avocados ripen in January. The Super Bowl is the first Sunday in February. Millions of people are going to need guacamole for their Super Bowl parties. Guacamole is made of avocados, which incidentally just came into season. The timing couldn't have been better. This was the opportunity the avocado had been waiting nearly a century for. It just needed the help of some savvy PR. In 1992, 
the public relations firm of Hill and Knowlton orchestrated the guacamole bowl. This particular PR team had been toiling to bring the avocado to the American dinner table for years now until they finally hit the jackpot with the guacamole bowl. During the 1992 Super Bowl, Hill and Knowlton recruited NFL players to share their favorite guacamole recipes. Then the public could vote on their favorite one. What could be more American than voting? How about influencing the news media to give yourself broader, more favorable coverage? And that's exactly what they did. They gave guacamole samples to sports reporters and news outlets, who in turn filled their publications with guacamole factoids and avocado statistics that captured the appetites of America. No matter which recipe won the final vote or which team won the Super Bowl, the real winner was the avocado. While the guacamole bowl was certainly a turning point in the long push for avocado acceptance, the increasingly diverse eating habits of the American populace and the lifting of trade restrictions with Mexico in the 90s have all contributed to the avocado's ascendancy to our dinner tables. So next time you're in the produce section of your local grocery store, take a moment to really look at an avocado. It's pretty weird, right? It doesn't seem like something you're supposed to eat. But the avocado serves as a reminder that we can't judge an outward appearance alone. It's what's on the inside that counts. And failing that, you can always hire a good PR team. Hey, so if you like what we're doing here, the easiest thing you can do is to subscribe, like, and share this video. But if you really like what we're doing and you wanna keep it going, you should become a supporter on Patreon. Our Patreon patrons get a lot of cool perks. They get access to our patrons only feed, uh, you can join us in a monthly live stream. There's a podcast we do and you get early access to that. And you get to see these videos before anybody else. So if you want to keep the good stuff going, go to patreon.com slash the good stuff and become a supporter. And thanks for watching.